Coming up, it's a life and death debate. Why an impending decision to change the nation's organ transplant system could be a killer move for KC. They want to change the allocation policies so the East and West Coast will take organs from here to Midwest. A key vote next month by the United Network for Organ Sharing, the body that coordinates the nation's organ transplantation system, has area health officials alarmed. Just because Kansas and Missouri have some of the highest organ donation rates in the country, should those livers and kidneys be sent across the country to improve wait times in cities and states where organ donation is low? This geographic inequity is not consistent with our goal as a transplant community. Where you live will directly impact whether you live or die. I don't really know that I have a lot of real thoughts about what's fair and what's right, except for that my son was very, very sick. And he got what he needed at the time that he really needed it. We dissect what's at stake this half hour with those on the front lines of organ transplantation here in the Metro. Plus, we review the rest of the week's news with Kraski and Helling. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. I'll look at the week's news later in the program. But first, it's probably something you don't even think about until you need one. By the end of today, 21 people will die in the United States waiting for an organ transplant. 123,000 are on waiting lists. Fortunately, waiting times here are some of the shortest in the country. That's because Kansas and Missouri residents are far more likely to donate their organs than on the east and west coasts. For example, the average wait time for a liver at KU Hospital is less than six months. In L.A., you could wait two and a half years. Kansas has the fourth highest liver donation rate in the country. New York ranks dead last in the percent of its residents who register as organ donors. So with long waits and sicker patients, a key meeting in Chicago in June of the nation's agency responsible for managing organ procurement wants to dramatically alter the way they are allocated. Redistribution would condense the 11 donor regions into as few as four. The move is being blasted locally with claims it would turn our area into an organ farm for the rest of the country. Dr. Richard Gilroy isn't happy with the proposed shakeup. He's director of liver transplantation at KU Hospital. Kim Harbour is a newly appointed member of the agency in charge of the nation's organ procurement system. She's the founder of Gift of Life that promotes organ donation. We thank you for being with us. And Rob Linderer is executive director of the Midwest Transplant Network, which coordinates organ donation in our metro with patients, families, and hospitals. With, can you just clarify for us very, very First of all, though, Dr. Gilroy, what are we actually talking about in terms of possible shakeup here? Are we just talking about all organs or specific organs? This is specifically for liver. They recently had a minor shakeup with the kidney allocation system and changed the way that those organs moved and are prioritized. But on this occasion, we're talking about livers. But an organ, making Kansas City an organ farm, the Midwest an organ farm for the rest of the nation, does that go a little bit too far? I, I think that uh, when you look at it, and the way you present it that way, it does go too far. But what we're really talking about is saving lives and how that may be achieved. The difference that, that we see are that you've got lower donor rates in areas that could increase their donor rates. You've got higher donor rates here. And that's why it was actually measured in the study that we completed as the index area. The region eight has the highest donor rates related to eligible donors. Why is it that we do have such high donor rates here, Rob? There's many factors that lead into that, but uh, I think pr predominantly it is uh, a very effective organization like uh, Midwest Transplant Network uh, doing very hard work with uh, hospitals that it partners with. We work with about 230 hospitals in our region and having very clear processes and expectations in terms of identifying and referring uh, donors and then our staff being prepared to respond to the hospital and uh, deal with the uh, beginning of the process and uh, determining authorization and consent from families is a big part of that reason. Should where you live, though, determine when you actually get an organ? And one of the big complaints, Kim, is that uh, people in New York City, for instance, have a longer waiting list. They may be sicker and yet have to wait longer than somebody in Kansas City would. Is that fair? Well, I think what, what I would go back with what they both said is the reason we are so successful here is because of all three of us around the table. We have a connection with uh, the transplant hospitals. We have a connection with Midwest Transplant Network. And then there's Gift of Life here on the forefront that's really educating our public 
about organ donation. And all of those three things have to connect together to be successful. It just takes one of those out of sync to make it not work. But Dr. Gilroy, supporters of this change, though, argue that they would actually save 500, more than 500 lives over the next five years if we change the geographic distribution of these organs. Oh, you know, um, anyone can actually model something. We've seen with the uh, GFC that there was modeling associated with the uh, financial system that was going to predict it be more stable. We saw it less stable. But what we see in this situation isn't that. What we see is an access issue as well that's never to talking about. And when you speak about these things, it's about access to care. In New York City, liver transplant treats end-stage liver disease. It's a proven treatment for those people who are in dire need or dire uh, probability of death. Now, by contrast, which is really important, in New York City, you're less likely to die of end-stage liver disease than you are in the Midwest. Why is that access? You can't get to a hospital easily here as compared to when you're actually in New York City where you've got the highest density of doctors per capita, you've got a high density of ICU beds, you've got a high density of specialized care. So they can keep their people alive longer. Second factor, they list more people per capita than we do here. We're around 6% of those people with end-stage liver disease are listed. New York, around 10%. So you put more people on a list, guess what? You're going to have more people waiting. But they're waiting and they're staying alive. Now when we look here, we have pa patients who are dying and our wait list mortality at the University of Kansas is 8, or at least the measure is 0.18. At Mount Sinai in New York, it is 0.22. At Columbia in New York, it's 0.1. Is it though fair though when we have the kind of system we have because of the differences in the wait times in certain areas, like here where it doesn't take you as long, that you could have somebody like the late Steve Jobs, the head of Apple, who went from Silicon Valley and flew to Tennessee to get a liver transplant because the wait times there were so short and he could get on a charter flight and just get on the list there. And, and, that, and that may be one aspect. Can I bring you back to another important aspect? The other important aspect, there was a relationship between the physician who referred him and the hospital that was there. Okay. That is not spoken of. But, but do, do we have people, though, because of the situation we have today, Rob, who are coming to Kansas because of the wait times are so low? Uh, I would assume that that is the case. I mean, Dr. Gilroy can certainly speak to that better than I in terms of the referral of patients and where they're coming from, but uh, it's public data that's out there and, and any uh, family or patient that is uh, looking at a transplant has access to that information and certainly has the freedom if, and if they have the resources to be able to relocate, to be able to uh, receive a transplant in a different time frame. So there's a paper that's coming out, I believe, in the next few months that's actually going to talk to that effect. Contracting is terribly important. Where you are transplanted is determined by your contract. If you're a Walmart employee in the state of Kansas and you're insured by their system, where do you get your liver transplant? not at the University of Kansas. It's in the Mayo system. You'll go to Rochester, Minnesota. You'll go to Mayo, Jacksonville. You'll go to Mayo, Arizona. Or you may go to Intermountain Health. They're the people with the contract, not us. We have shipped people by helicopter out of our state to be transplanted there. Contracting influences a lot of things. We, uh, at the center th last week, shipped two people to other centers to be transplanted for contracting. Now, we've got 94% one-year survival. We don't have contracts with that group. Now you, you are going to be serving on the UNOS board, the actual board that is governing the transplantation system. Have you been to any of the meetings yet, Ken? No, I leave on Sunday, first okay. meeting. And so you're going to be giving them a little bit of your, a piece of your mind, or what, what is the deal Nick, here? I'm not going to give them a piece of my mind yet. I'm going to listen, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to absorb all the information that I need to first before I give them a piece of my mind, maybe. Okay, so uh, one of the issues that's come up in the, this whole discussion is that uh, rather than changing the distribution system, we should be actually just increasing overall the number of organs. How do we actually do that? Well, when our son needed a liver transplant in 1996, and he was successfully transplanted at the age of 11 months old, my husband and I are both from here. And we felt there was a need to educate the community about organ donation. So that's what we have done with starting a gift of life. You know, in some countries, like Spain and Austria, for instance, there is a opt 
uh, out policy, so rather than on your driver's licenses that you have to make a specific request to be an organ donor, they have an assumed knowledge that you are going to be one unless you say you're not going to be one. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what's the issue of being able to do that here? Okay, so the New York, uh, you're, the, there's actually an article that came out uh, yesterday in the New York Daily News and they spoke about some of the problems with their system. It's a complex series of relationships. It's the community, it's the hospitals, it's the OPO, you know, the transplant programs. When they work cohesively, you have higher rates. When there is a dissociation, it's lower. And if you look at trying to register to, for donation in the New York City, it takes 20 minutes and an online process. Most people don't have that. You do it in the state of Texas, it takes about 20 seconds. Even when you have put your name on your driver's license and said, I am an organ donor, that does not mean, though, your, do your organs are going to be donated upon your death. You still have to get a next of kin to say, yes, um, I will allow that person to have those organs uh, d donated. D do you have instances, Rob, where people say no, even when somebody has organ donor on the driver's license? Uh, 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 that's correct. I, I think the, we do have instances where families may be opposed to a, a person's wish or if they hadn't indicated that they wish to be a donor, it would fall to the family in those circumstances. I think our system works very well. It's altruistically based. Uh, I think the opt-out uh, system is may work well in other countries, but I think with our history and our founding documents and, and founders' view that individual autonomy is a critical issue, uh, the model of the UAGA works quite well. And we find that uh, in our experience, uh, the registration percentages in Missouri and in Kansas have uh, gone up dramatically. I think it's 68 percent in Missouri and 56 percent in Kansas. Now we were talking about how high it is here in contrast to other places. You were part of a major study that looked at the registration rates across the country and in New York City uh, it's not just a question where we have we know for instance that minority participation has been very low but also white but participation is incredibly low in New York City. So, you know, the study was important because what we tried to do is look at the ideal donor population. So in the Midwest, people who become organ donors aged between 18 and 39 donate at rates around 90 percent. And then when we looked at that same population, which was the population from which you get what would be best termed an ideal donor, i.e. the like, greatest likelihood of all the graphs working and everything going well, when we compared it around the country, significant difference in New York was lower. And why it was significantly lower, there are many reasons that have been postulated or put forward. But at the end of the day, one, and one of them was that reporting may differ between areas uh, or different OPOs. But it's a consistent difference. And so they donate at lower rates. And we're not sure why. That needs to be looked into. But I suspect it's community relationships. And it's the relationships of centers, hospitals, OPOs, and the that general will. One big myth I looked at as to why people don't donate is because they think, oh, they're too old to donate their organs. But I understand there's no barrier on age for donating organs? Well, there's a maximum age to donate organs. And they can probably answer this a lot better than I can. But I, you know, when I go into the classrooms, I tell that, which is what I do, is it just reach high school, 25,000 high school students and their family members each school year and uh, they all say well you know were, were we too old or too young to donate and I always say to them consider yourself a donor if that's what you really want to do and then at the time of your death you will be evaluated medically to determine what can be donated and then they're fine with that so they can they can probably talk to the maximum age on I mean, organs uh, and tissue. We've, we've donated or at least had people who've been 80 and donated mm -hmm. livers successfully and I'm sure out in the general community there are graphs that are over 100 years old if you look at the age of the mm -hmm. donor relative to the recipient and what's happened since. It becomes more difficult when they get older but more importantly I think that one of the things to consider is what about if you're the person waiting mm -hmm. and that's sometimes what's forgotten you think about your friend your family member those individuals whom you wish to help and sometimes it's interesting that some groups are willing to be recipients and they're not willing to be donors and that's to me and I've looked at driver's license I've asked people why they're never really able to explain it to me but they're not donors yet they're happy to take an organ Kim Harbour and Rob Linderer, thank you for dissecting this issue with us. And Dr. Richard Gilroy, Director of the Liver Transplant Program at KU Hospital. Up next, the rest of the week's news with Kraski and Helling.
The Kansas legislature's wrap-up session has stretched into a fifth week with no clear end in sight, but there is some good news. Some lawmakers are refusing to accept their paychecks as the session continues into indefinite overtime. Twenty-four legislators, all of them Republicans, turned down their $88 daily salary. So that's a positive. With us to dissect this story and some of the other big stories of the week, Star Political Columnist and the host of Up to Date on KCURFM, Steve Kraske, and Kansas City Star reporter, columnist and blogger, Dave Helling. Why is it only that Republicans are willing to give up their paychecks, Steve? Well, maybe, Nick, it's because Republicans tend to make more money in their private lives than <laughs> Democrats do. I don't, I don't know how else to, to slice that. Democrats over in Topeka feel like, hey, we're working hard to wrap up this session and close this $400 million budget gap, and we deserve to get paid. So there's a difference in philosophy here, I, I think. Three weeks in a row I've tried to put that headline up on the screen that says Kansas session ends. <laughs> Why is it still so problematic to do that and pull the trigger yeah, on that? I, I, I think, by the way, Kansans would gladly pay that $88 a day if they just fix this problem and go home, which they can't do, because the, the, the fractured nature of the Republican caucus in both the House and the Senate is evident. You have hardline conservatives who don't want to even think about voting for any kind of tax increase, let alone actually vote for one. Moderates who say, hey, we have to govern, and Democrats who are sitting on their hands watching the uh, opposite opposition party squirm. That's a recipe for stalemate. No one has yet figured out the way to not only address this problem, Nick, but to address it in myriad ways uh, so that you can cobble together a majority vote in either house. And it may take a couple more weeks to get that done. You know, this is just an absolutely fascinating political experiment going on in Topeka, asking these conservative Republicans to raise taxes uh, to the tune of $400 million. It's like asking oil to mix with water. These people don't work that way. They're not programmed that way. How this is going to play out remains to be seen. As we tape this this morning, some movement in the state House of Representatives to wrap this thing up. The thinking in Topeka is the Senate's the tougher nut to crack here. This thing, in theory, could, be, could wind up quickly or it could go on several more weeks here. We don't know as, as we sit here. But watching these guys wrestle with this and really coming to recognize that the Brownback tax cuts of two or three years ago have been a failure. That, that hasn't worked and they're having to now raise taxes to replace uh, the cuts that were made. Now, while the stalemate remains on that $400 million budget hole, it doesn't mean other business isn't getting done. Lawmakers sending to Governor Brown back a bill changing when you vote, awaiting the governor's signature, a measure shifting local elections, including those for school board from the spring to the fall. Supporters say it's all about improving voter turnout. But what evidence is there that moving these elections will actually get more people involved, Dave? Well, because there are typically more people who go to the polls in the, the spring elections are very, very problematic. Kansas City, as you know, moved its election season back, Kansas City, Missouri, for a similar reason, getting people to focus on politics and decisions in the late winter, early spring is very, very problematic. The, but we should not ignore the partisan nature of some of this, too, by having a bigger turnout in Kansas. Republicans think they will have more opportunities to carry even nonpartisan elections like school boards. That's what's behind a lot of So what of do you movement. see happening as a result of this? Well, the, the people who are pushing this, Nick, think this will result in a doubling of the turnout. But keep in mind, this is moving the elections to odd-numbered years, right. meaning like 2015, not presidential election years. But uh, again, opponents suspect what's happening here is that down the road, Republicans will try to move these elections into even-numbered years, presidential election years, and make these elections partisan as a way to really boost the prospects of Republicans and get more Republicans in local offices across the state. A brand new 800-room downtown convention hotel proposal is on a zippy fast track through City Hall, even as the pitch reports that half the cost of the $300 million project could wind up being paid for by public taxes. Meanwhile, in the Star, Dave Helling, you are struck by how swiftly hotel this hotel is moving, even as the mayor slows down debate over the minimum wage, declaring it needs more thoughtful consideration. So why the distinction between the pace on these two issues? Well, I think because the mayor believes that he spent two years trying to put the hotel thing together in private and that there's no need for a long public debate over that, as opposed to the minimum wage, which was driven in some ways by a citizen's petition, and because of a deadline in state law, Nick, that provides arguably a window for the city to raise the minimum wage. But the point I was trying to make is the mayor suggests, I think rightly, that the minimum wage needs some serious study. 
Uh, but, but so does it, a huge that's hotel. that's true, so does a Absolutely. huge hotel. And to suggest that some artificial deadline must be imposed to get it done by August 1st when the new council come in, comes in, I think is a mistake. I think that the people of Kansas City deserve a good, solid, quality conversation about a $150 million investment in this project. I don't disagree with that at all. I think what the mayor's up against here is the, the, the possibility of having some new council members come in, having to educate those people and bring them all up to speed on this very complex complex downtown convention hotel project is a formidable idea. He wants to get it wrapped up before then. Likewise, on the minimum wage, the council has sees some more time here. They have until late August now to deal with this, pass something locally to what appears to be to take advantage of a new state law and get something passed here locally that raises the minimum wage. A little more time uh, on, on, uh, in the offing here for Kansas City. The mayor of Wyandotte County, Mark Holland, is yeah. out on tour this week. He's talking to residents about what they should do with a $12 million windfall. That's $12 million a year every year. New money the county's getting now that it's finished paying the bonds used to finance the Village West retail and entertainment development. What do residents have in mind for that money? Well, I made a list here, and this is a new day for Wyandotte County, Nick. $12 well, million excellent bucks a homework, year. Steve. Yeah, You've I've done some homework here. Everything. This Listen is to the list here of what residents came up with in meetings just this week. Property tax relief, aging services, resurfacing roads, snow removal, demolition of dilapidated uh, homes and businesses, codes enforcement, mowing vacant locks, uh, lots, uh, park equipment, swimming pool, police services. The list goes on on and on, Mayor Holland has made a point over and over again that while $12 million is a nice problem to have, a nice nest egg to begin spending here, that's not going to solve all the problems of Wyandotte County, particularly the eastern third of the county that still is so racked with poverty and well, other problems. Why don't we ever hear about these windfalls on the Missouri side of the state line? You know, well, why isn't it that we're ever paying off the bonds on, say, Sprint Center or on the Power and Light District and they're getting these windfalls of money? Well. Uh, first of all, the dog ate my homework. I'm sorry I didn't bring <laughs> some, my, my stuff with me. But um, what we do, I mean, for, for example, the convention hotel yes. is going to be paid for by bonds that are being paid off for the Sprint Center. So there are examples of this. The Legends is a big project. Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County has been counting on this money for some time. They knew that this windfall would approach. And so I do think you'll see some discussion of the various items that Steve suggests. But, you know, they're not turning to me for advice, but it seems smarter, perhaps, to spend all of that money on one problem and sort of tackle one big problem rather than to parcel it out over, you know, a little bit more grass mowing, a little bit more road construction. Um, you know, I think sometimes w w legislatures, governmental bodies, cities, take this kind of money and try to make everyone happy and in essence make no one happy. And so my guess is Wyandotte County might say, hey, there's one big thing we need to get done. Let's apply this money over many years and see if we can do it. It's that. a nice problem to have. Y you bet. Yeah. Would you vote to raise your taxes to pay for free preschool? The push has begun to add free preschool to your upcoming election ballot, while the Hickman Mills School District recently added free pre-K for all students by making some major budget sacrifices. The city is being asked to fund pre free pre-K, rather, for all students in the Kansas City, Missouri School District, funded by a five levy increase. Now, I love the use of the word levy in the story, but isn't that just a property tax increase? Yes, it is. Uh, that's a synonym for a property yes. tax increase, Nick. And, you know, pre-K uh, education is sort of a hot buzz issue in education circles around the country. And it's a really attractive idea for Kansas City, Missouri, in that school district where so many students struggle with basic skills, math, reading, that kind of thing. This might be something people want to consider, but it's also asking some of the city's poorest citizens to increase taxes for something like this. And how many issues can we have on the ballot at once? I mean, we certainly were looking at a potential minimum wage increase on the August ballot, which was now... I don't think... No, it's off. not going on the August ballot. It's too late for that. You so, had to put but then, it on... Then we have an earnings tax coming up, too, and I know... Yeah, it was next moving. year. Okay. Next year, you'll have that in 2016. You can have as many things as you want on the ballot. It always seems like in Kansas City, they raise taxes. They don't really cut them over time. But there's another component to the school thing that's important to consider, Nick. Kansas, for example, as you may know, considered all day kindergarten. Governor Brownback, of all people, proposed additional spending for that, in part because school, I'll try to be as blunt about this as I can, school can provide relief for parents who have daycare expenses that are very, very high. And if you expand preschool, if you exp expand kindergarten, it does help parents pay less 
for child care, and that's a selling point for a lot of parents with young children. Sure. That may be a selling point in this campaign as so well. So if that would put on the ballot, would it have a chance of passing, Steve? I, I think so, because that's such a popular idea, pre-kindergarten education. I think it'll appeal to a lot of people, even folks who struggle with their budgets every month. Well, last week, the Incredible Entertainment Center shuts its doors in Overland Park after declaring bankruptcy. This week, the 133-year-old Kansas City Club padlocks its doors and pursues bankruptcy. Only 18% of city clubs active in the 1980s remain open today, according to a star story on the club's closing. Some people I spoke with this week, though, had absolutely no idea what the Kansas City Club was <laughs> or what it did. Why is it significant? Well, it has a history, Nick, in this town. Uh, people who have walked through the doors there include Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. It was a gathering place for many, many dec decades of the power brokers of this city where they gathered to, to take care of city business. But those days have long passed, and you don't hear people talk about the Kansas City Club much anymore. But it certainly is one of those moments that uh, th this city will experience. Yeah, but I, I think uh, Steve is very disappointed. He was a <laughs> charter member of the Kansas City Club. Yeah. That's where he was quite welcome. Got all his... <laughs> scoops down there actually <laughs> waiting outside the door to talk to important people it was it's a beautiful building if you go in or it was at one time walnut paneling but it's really the relic of a bygone era in which very yes. important men and it was men would meet for lunch cut deals go for a swim there was a pool there that little type of thing little racquetball and uh, it, you know it's an anachronism they're closing all over the country for a reason they're they're a, a part of a bygone era Steve Kraske, keeping you up to date weekdays at 11 on KCURFM. Thanks so much for being with you us. Bet, and the Nick. stars, Dave Helling, thank you. That is our Week in Review. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.